Oh, man, we got hacked. We got the ocean spray guy. Hey, man, I really liked your video. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, people kept tagging me in that video. So I was like, all right, I got to do it. Uh, and, and and I didn't want to shave my head just yet. So it, it took me a little bit of time. I, I was afraid I missed the boat, but uh, nah, I you nailed it. love for it. It was you perfect. Know. You nailed it. You, you have a very similar look and... There was another guy that I also thought could have maybe pulled it off is Vince Pichel. Same thing, you know, shaved head. Um, same kind of like tan. Yeah, I, guess, he, he glow. Say I look like him all the time, too, so I, I get it. How you doing, Cub? I'm doing pretty good. Just uh, getting ready for the next one, you know. Hey, you're rocking the UFC gym uh, gear. and I, I saw that you and some of the boys were training in Costa Mesa. That's yeah. right. How, how's that going? I mean, that's probably about, what, three years old now that you and Bisping took that thing over? Yeah, uh, I think it's a little over three years. Um, that's pretty much where I'm doing my, my whole camps nowadays. Uh, I did most of my last camp there and, and I've been trained there all year. Uh, we have a real unique setup at that gym where we're um, a big portion of our gym is, is outdoors. Uh, and and so we're one of the only gyms in Orange County that's allowed to stay open. So we've been getting a kind of a lot of traffic through there. Uh, we've also been getting a lot of inspectors coming by to make sure we're doing all everything, you know, to code people wearing masks and stuff like that. Um, as long as, cause they have to check in indoors and then go to the outdoor area and then they can take it off and work out. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been, we've been very fortunate that, that, we've been able to stay open. Are you still doing anything with the training lab? Uh, no, they're, they're still friends of mine, but I, I'm not really training over there. I still train with Juan and TJ and everybody. Um, but I just, I'm at the point where I, I like to have my group of friends. I don't really do the structured class. Everyone do this. Um, I know what I need to work. I have my, my core group of guys that, Hey, let's work this today. Um, and, and I've been running my own, my own camps for a long time, just, you know, uh, jumping into, even when I was going out to, to Jackson's, um, you know, most of my camp I was doing on my own and then going out there to, for them to help me. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to what you were saying about the gym, like they were surprise visits, like how are they handling it that with businesses that, like, you know, the whole indoor and outdoor uh, part? Okay. So we we have like we took over a mitsubishi dealership so like the back area that where they used to pull the cars in and work on them they have two covered ports but the middle section is is open so uh we have bags on one of the ports that goes along the whole way and then we have like a bunch of lifting uh equipment on the other side and then down the middle is turf um so we run classes out there um the we're doing less classes right now, group classes, but people are just kind of distance all throughout there. We'll, there'll be like 50 people out there. Um, and, and everyone, you know, is able to work out. And then we were able to move our indoor equipment to the front. And we did like a, like a chain link fence covered around the front area. Um, and, and that that's covered as well, but, but there's open air. And yeah, so we, we had to, you know, jump through a couple hoops with the city, um, but we did everything they asked and we've been able to stay open the entire time. That's genius. Who takes credit for this? You or Bisping? <laughs> well, of course, Bisping's going to take credit, but uh, <laughs> UFC Gym Corporate uh, manages the gym. So, you know, we get to show up and, you know, just say hi to people and, and, and you know, show our face and, and just work out. So it. it you know, we, we don't really have to do a, a whole lot. Update us on the knee. I mean, I, I don't think you would have taken a fight booking without being 100 percent. So uh, how how has it felt? You know, this was I think the first really major injury. No disrespect to the hand stuff that happened a long time ago over and over that you you have, you know, that you haven't had any problems with since then. But um, how how are you feeling? Was it how was it mentally to overcome something like that? Well, it was just a whole nother animal. Uh, breaking bones is four to six weeks. I, I got used to that, you know, no big deal. Uh, it'll heal quick, come right back. But knowing that this was going to be, you know, a year long process was, was it, it was tough, you know, it, it, like the three, four month mark. You're like, okay, man, when do I get to 
start doing jujitsu and do all that. And, and uh, you just got to really pull the reins and, and be smart. Uh, I think I was very fortunate to listen to a lot of people and have good people around. I had a good surgeon. I was in shape when I got the surgery. Um, and and I, I bounced back fairly quick. Uh, but it still has been this entire time. Um, and as, as of right now, I can literally do everything that I, that I could do before the surgery. Just, it, it takes a little bit of icing and things like that sometimes. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'll ever be 100%. I believe I will be. Um, but you wouldn't notice. I, I, I feel like I'm moving just as fast and as, as I have in the last 10 years. So uh, I'm feeling really good. Uh, I had a good team around me, like I said, and, and luckily I was able to push through this whole quarantine thing. There was a, a solid six months of me having to do my physical therapy and do all that stuff with the mask on. And um, it, it was it was tough, but I think uh, it made me train really hard for this fight. What about on the mental side, Cub? Uh, coming back from the injury, do you remember a particular point where you said, today's the day I'm really going to test this, or today's the day that I can 100% prove that I, I feel like I could still do all this? Do you remember that day? Uh, well, it's I did it in, in stages. So I started doing jujitsu at a certain point and with the knee brace. And then at a certain point, I started saying, I'm not even like thinking about being in a, in a bad position um, you know, doing like a Baron Bolo with my, my leg tied up, um, you know, battling for a position and somebody trying to do a calf slice on me on that knee. Um, and then just, you know, one day being able to take it off. Uh, I, I was helping Ortega train for, um, for the Korean zombie. And there was a couple of times where he, you know, kicked me pretty solid in that leg when I had all my weight on it. And, it, you know, I took a solid shot. Uh, cause we were in the thick of sparring and, uh, that was like a test and it, and it's like, I gave it a couple of days after that. Okay. Uh, this is good. So I had like a checklist and I did it one thing at a time. I never tried to push myself too hard. I was realistic. Um, and I, and I feel like I've, I've passed all those tests. I, I was really trying to fight November 28th. Uh, then the UFC, uh, told me that they had me booked for November, uh, December 12th. And I was like, okay, a year to the day that I injured it, I could, I could see that storyline. Okay. Uh, and it's two more extra weeks. So, uh, I, I was, I was happy with that. Uh, I feel like it's perfect timing. I want to ask you about the Swansons. I caught that and I learned so much from watching you and your family interact. But one thing that really stood out to me was everything that you're going through with your career, with your injury, it seems like it's easier because they're around. Like, And I don't want to call them a distraction, but I could just see your mind being a father, you know, just, it, it just seemed like it would make maybe the, the sadness that would come with not being able to fight a little bit easier. Can you talk about the Swansons, where people can catch it and just how you came about doing that? Cause it was awesome. Oh, uh, thank you. I mean, you know, me and Kenda, we, we, <laughs> We struggle, you know, we have three toddlers and uh, especially during this year, we haven't had a whole lot of help. Uh, my mom was helping out as much as she, as she could. She got COVID um, like a, a bunch of people in my family, so she couldn't be around. Um, but it's just, it's been a hard year for everyone. And, and we, you know, we just kind of wanted to share um, how, how it's been for us. Um, you know, Kenda's got her other job. She still works for the UFC. She hasn't been able to all this year. Uh, and I want her to go and, and, and be able to get out of the house and go, uh, you know, create something. She's been working on this business for a long time. And I'm still chasing my dream. Um, but at the same time, we made a commitment to, you know, have kids and, um, you know, give them uh, a, a big chunk of us. So I, I wasn't going to keep pursuing fighting and not commit to that. So I, I say nowadays, you know, I was a full-time fighter before, but now I'm, you know, I'm part-time dad, part-time fighter. I do it both. I, I feel like I'm trying to be super dad now. Uh, I'm working out just as hard, but I'm, I'm in the thick of it, changing diapers and doing all that stuff. We, we share duties. Um, just that when I'm getting closer to the fight, she, she steps up a lot and, and really helps out um, 
uh, take a little bit more of the load. But, um, you know, we, we, we make a good team. Um, as far as the show, the Swansons, we're, we're putting it on our social media, mostly Instagram right now. Um, but we just kind of wanted to show everybody, you know, we're normal people and we, we have struggles and, uh, we, we wanted to show like how we're getting through this it, with three toddlers. It, it, you know, anybody that has toddlers knows that it, it's, it's not an easy task and, but we're just trying to enjoy the ride. We wanted to be able to record it so that we could look back on it and, and laugh about it and enjoy it. Uh, and then for us, we don't get to see all our family all the time. So it, they get to see it and then our fans get a little inside of what we're going through. Is King more of a handful than Royal and Saint combined? Uh, King and Royal are definitely the most, uh, they're, they're the, they're the two handfuls. Usually, um, Royal kind of equals the twins together. Uh, she, she's quite a handful. And, uh, if, if the twins are together, they can, they can be calm. But as soon as we add her into the mix, it, it becomes chaos. So we have to separate them quite a bit. Uh, but you know, you got to understand they've been in the house all year long. Um, we've done a really good job of, of keeping everybody COVID free. And, and right now we have, you know, three more weeks. So we're, we're not taking any risks, you know, no Thanksgiving, um, not introducing anybody new. So yeah, we're, we're keeping it tight. I wanted to ask you, we had Juan Archuleta on our show after he won his title. Uh -huh. He said you were one of the guys that inspired him. How about him winning the title? How does he inspire you back? Man, um, I was telling him in my last fight, I had him in my corner and I heard his voice more than anybody. Um, just because we push each other in the gym every day, like he lives down the street from me. And uh, it's kind of a crazy circle. You know, Joe Daddy had a huge impact in my career and gave me an opportunity and introduced me to people. And then he... Uh, uh, introduced me to Juan and I basically did the same thing for Juan. Um, and we've just kind of came up as, as really good friends and training partners. Um, every time, every time he has a fight coming up, that's, I get like a pass that this is like my training camp. Um, Kenda's like, yeah, go. If, if Juan needs me, I'm there, you know? Um, and he does the same for me. So when it's my camp, uh, he's like anything you need, I'll be there. If I say, I got to, I got to do this. He'll, he'll say, I'll pick you up and we'll go together. So we, we just, we're both grinders. We, we work hard. And, uh, I, I just got to say, uh, being there for his, his title fight was just, you know, it was huge. It was an inspiration. Uh, I was just happy to be a part of it. And, you know, one of the cool things about helping other fighters reach their dreams is you get all the same emotions out of it without getting punched in the face. So it, <laughs> It's 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 pretty cool, and it gives me like a glimpse of life after fighting, of of helping these other guys, uh, you know, chase their dreams like I have. And you don't have to do the weight cut either. Exactly, I'm. I'll be there eating like you're doing good. Keep it up. <laughs> hey man, the team's got some momentum. Ortega picked up a big win uh, last month. TJ, of course, comes back. You know, he's held some belts as well. Um, I guess. Did you ever envision when you started, because like you said, I remember you did some training in India, you know, and then Joe Daddy took you to Jackson Wink, and then the training lab, training lab, excuse me, became a part of your life. Um, hell, I think I even remember you going to Mark Munoz's gym at, at one time. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But now this group that you guys have created in your own gym, Cub, that's, that's a trip, man, just the way things have come full circle like that. Yeah, when we moved out here to, to uh, Orange County, um, Juan came from from Victorville, and then I came from Palm Springs, and we had Georgie coming from Riverside. Our whole goal was like, look, man, we have a solid group of guys that love to work hard. We have a great time together. Let's just keep this core group of guys together. And whether we were training at the training lab or we go to HB Ultimate or we're at my gym or we meet up with Georgie somewhere in Riverside, like – we just stay in communication and uh, we just meet up and we train hard. It, it, it's been, it, it's been awesome to have a, a good solid group, solid group of guys. And then uh, one more thing about the, I think a, a huge thing for me with, 
you know, Juan started training with Ortega a while back and, you know, me and him, we, we, we never really got along after we fought. Um, we had a little bit of tension and, um, I know that he wanted to, to kind of change as a fighter and evolve and, and I needed to as well. So I finally swallowed my pride and, and, and I offered him a gift and, and, and we, we called it cool. And then we finally started training together and I was like, man, Hey, just, you want to be better. You gotta, you gotta be the bigger man too. And, and, uh, and, and so just little things like that, uh, through my careers, you, you grow up and, uh, you establish, uh, friendships and you, you, the whole goal is for us to be better. So, um, that, that's kind of like the, the, the way it is for all of us. And, and with TJ coming back, um, he's got something to prove. I, I we're all going to, going to have a good 20, uh, 2021, I think. Yeah. Um, can you follow up on, you said you offered him a gift. Did you mean like just, you know, you shook his hand or, or did you really go, Hey man, a peace offering and give him something? Yeah. So <laughs> I had randomly, you know, sometimes you, you want to take care of your training partner. So I had randomly found this, uh, this website that let you put, uh, any picture on a Johnny Walker bottle. So I took our poster of me and him facing off and I made, uh, I made a couple bottles, uh, of Johnny Walker with me and his fight poster. Cool. And I had, I had made them and then I lost the fight. And then I didn't want to give them to my coaches because I kind of felt like they were worthless at, like to me at the time because it's not as important as when you have a big win, you know. And I thought that that fight was setting me back up for a title fight. So I had given one to my boxing coach, um, Antonio, for coming out and and because he had to come out last minute to help me instead of his brother, Joel. And then I just had one and I it was just sitting there forever and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. And so when uh, when me and Juan had talked about training with Ortega, uh, he was like, yeah, just talk, man. You guys work it out. So I, I just thought that that would be the easiest way. Um, I signed it under my, under my picture, and then I gave it to him, and I said, hey, man, uh, I just thought that you would like you to appreciate this more than I would. Um, and, and, and ever since then, it's been, it's been good. That's awesome, bro. That's a great story. Yeah. Hey Cub, I want to talk a little bit about something you brought up when when you brought up Juan. You talked about dreams, and I started thinking. Uh, I know you're focused on your opponent now, but how often are the dreams still the same? How often do you think about the belt, even things that can come later in your career, like Hall of Fame? You know, when people break down what you need to be, what you need to do to be there. Um, how close do you think you are to something like that? Do you think about the belt? Do you think about Hall of Fame, these type of things still, or have the things changed a little bit? Yeah, I actually do. You know, I think Bisbing was, uh, was an inspiration to me. Um, and, and, you know, because right when we decided to work together on this UFC gym, Costa Mesa, uh, literally the same month he got that title fight, just short notice. And I remember me and Kami, uh, my manager, we're, we're partners in the gym. Uh, we were like, wow, what if he wins? This would be great for everyone, you know? Uh, and then when he won, we just looked at each other like, you know, what a stud. Uh, so just seeing that whole thing of him and his whole career and, and him winning the title, um, you know, so late in his career was, was an inspiration to me. So I just kind of, I don't really think about fighting for the belt. I, I just want to focus on my performances uh i think that's the, what i really need to work on because that's that's always been my ultimate goal is is have the best performances you can uh that way when i do retire down the road i'll, I'll feel i'll feel satisfied um knowing that i gave it my best uh if i get put myself in the opportunity to fight for a title you know that would be a dream come true um but at the end of the at the end of the day, it's not my decision 100%. I've been right there, and it it, it, it wasn't my decision. Uh, it was somebody else's. So I can't control that. I can only do my best. And But if the opportunity comes, then, then I'll jump for it. Uh, as far as Hall of Fame, like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what the criteria, criteria is. Um, I, I think I, I've had, had a great career, and I've inspired a lot of people. Uh, I think people appreciate me for my hard work and, and just, you know, pushing through for so many years, uh, like LeBron, I'm on year 17. Uh, so 
I, I just, you know, if that happened, that would be crazy, but I don't know what I'd have to do uh, to, to, to make that happen. I just can, I just got to focus on one fight at a time and, and, and try to be the best version of myself. Before we started the interview, George mentioned that you were on the seventh or sixth episode of, uh, of our show. And I started thinking about some of those days and some of our conversations back there. And I remember two of them. I remember one, you saying, I feel like eventually I'm, I'm going to be at 155. That'll happen further down the road in my career. And then I also, at the time, Uriah Faber was very big in the WEC. And then I remember you also saying, I feel like I just have this gut feeling that one day I'm going to fight him anyway. We were, we were talking about going up and weight class and all that. Those two things, are they still things that seem like maybe could happen one day? Yeah, it's funny you say that because I've been thinking a lot about, you know, because I'm not ranked right now. Um, that was kind of freeing, actually. Um, it, it was funny. I was actually talking to, to Dominic Cruz one day at the PI. Um, we hadn't spoken in a long time, and, and he was, like, asking me about fights and this and that. And I was like, oh, I can only fight certain people because I was ranked. And he was like, tell them to unrank you. And I was like, what? I had never I had never even thought of that. Like, what? who would ask for that? But, like, at this point in my career, it was a little freeing because, like, I could fight anybody. It made me think about the possibilities of uh, fighting at 35, fighting at 55. Um, you know, there, there's fights that I've always thought would be great. Like at 55, uh, uh, a friend of mine, though, Anthony Pettis, uh, uh, at 35, Uriah Faber. Um, you know, I could even fight Aldo at 35. So there's a lot of there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, I I could see that at the later part of my career, they, they'd want to see some old school WC matchups. So uh, I even wanted to bring up, you know, you keep making up these these belts, the, the BMF belt and this and that. Look, why don't we bring back the WEC belt? Who wants some? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it, man. And you know, what's funny is when I posted on social media about this being show 3106 and you were on show number six, so 3,000 shows later, you know, and I posted a pic. We all look different, of, of course. Um, I took the time to also jump on your Instagram. So I was seeing the Swansons. I was seeing the pics that you had posted. But on one of those, TJ's there standing next to you. And then I was looking at you guys. And I swear I was going to go stole my thunder a little bit. But I was I was going to ask you, would you ever do 135? But I, I could have sworn that you would probably give me Frank Mirface. face. Like, nah, I'm not doing that. But I guess Aldo did make it, you know, and, and yeah. uh, I don't know. I, I guess I guess there's something to this. Well, the the thing is, is I think Aldo was an inspiration for me on that. Uh, I really was in question if he would make it, um, and, and he's gotten some slack for it. I think I think he looked great at 135 so far. I think that in the later rounds, he's. I mean, we've been doing this a long time, so keeping a high pace you're not going to be able to, to sustain a high pace and he's fighting the cream of the crop, you know, and, and he's been in, doing this for so long. So I thought he looked great at 135. Um, so it kind of just made me think about it. Uh, I've never tried to make it that far down. Um, I feel like I have gotten a little bit um, smaller in the last couple of years. Uh, making 45 has actually gotten a little easier for me. Um, but I, yeah, so it just kind of opened up the idea of me possibly doing a 35 fight, possibly doing 55. Um, yeah, the, I'm, I'm open to the ideas. I think the biggest thing at this point is, for one, I got this fight ahead of me. I, I'm trying to get some momentum and, and, and I've made a, a lot of changes in my style. Um, and brought some things back, introducing new things. So I'm, I'm just trying to get on rhythm of, of you know, Cub 5.0 and, uh, and then if whatever happens after that, any any just fun fights at 55 or 35 or 45, I think that's the biggest thing. I just want fights that, that are interesting to me. Just two more quick ones. Uh, one, how often or have you even been golfing? I know that you were taking a liking to it and you actually got good at it. Yeah, so it, it's been it's been difficult. I've I've been dying to go golfing and I've uh, been two times uh, since I hurt my knee. Um, and, and I've actually done really well. Uh, 
it's it's funny. I feel like I've done well because I'm wear I was wearing a knee brace and I knew that you know I'm driving all that weight into that knee. So I I wasn't using my driver. I was using a hybrid, um, that just a tee off, and 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 I was just playing like real smart game, and I was playing really well. So uh, I, I I would love to play more. Um, this whole fighting thing gets in the way. I was playing, uh, but yeah, it's it's something that I want to do more. Uh, but yeah, I still got it. You know, you're not the best. MMA fighter in golf? I might give you number two. I know you're not the best, but do you think you're the second best golfer out of all the MMA fighters? I mean, possibly. Uh, I, I don't know. I I never really keep score because I lose. Um, it's funny. I, I've kept score a couple times, but the whole game, I just get a little bit uh, kind of bored. I go out there to play to relax. So I'll play a couple holes where I'm really trying and then a couple holes where I just I'm just enjoying being outdoors and and, and not having stress because I I feel like our job is so stress, uh, stressful that when I go out there, like I see these people stressing about their stroke and, and don't talk in my backswing. And I'm like, dude, come on. Like you got to be able to like have people boo while you swing, like like grow up, like it's not a big deal, you know, so. I go out there to relax, but I feel like I still am pretty good. But I have been wanting to put on uh, a MMA's, um, an MMA golf tournament. And I've had this idea for a while. I've even talked to people about it. Uh, but I would love to, to do a fun tournament uh, that, that we could stream, um, but have like a, you know, some fun rules in it, a lot of trash talking. Uh, cause you got to do it more MMA style. We're not going to be all preppy and, and quiet. And it's like, no, you're allowed to heckle and you're allowed to talk crap and do side bets. You know, you want to make it interesting. I could do a whole show on how much I get on my tits that golfers need that quiet. Same thing with tennis players when they're doing a serve or when they're driving or whatever. It's, I mean, you got NBA players who shoot free throws and people are waving balloons, their arms, making noise. People on the line are talking to you. You got guys standing up there getting ready to swing at a baseball 100 miles an hour where it could dip in with a nasty curve at 75 miles an hour, all kinds of noise, and all of a sudden golf golfers, how about even football? That's actually got these collisions, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden golfers want you to be yeah, I gotta drive. It's like get the fuck out of here with that one. So thank you for saying that, Cub. Now, now the golfers got a problem with it. I'm gonna say not the Cubs want and I don't have to deal with them. But aren't you curious who the best golfer in MMA is? I am. I am. I am curious. Who Who are you gonna say? Patrick Cote is a scratch golfer. You don't want to invite him. Don't invite him to your to your um, event if you if it if it goes off. Don't invite him because he'll take it down. Um, I don't know of any other I, – I guess I do know a few others that I've seen out there. I actually saw King Mo golfing once, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. I uh, I feel like me and TJ play about the same level. Um, let's see. I played with um, – uh, who else have I played with? I played with a bunch of guys. Cormier's taking it up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought you were going to say Luke Rockhold because the people would always bring him up. Um, I don't know how, how good he actually is, but I would imagine we're all roughly around the same level. I mean, uh, you know, I'll, hit, I'll double bogeys, you know, but the, the other day uh, when I first got back out, the first hole I eagled, it was like the first eagle I've had. I was like, oh, that was a nice start. <laughs> and I never warm up. But like to me, that's what the first three holes are for is warming up. It's like there's 18 holes. There's a lot of a lot to be playing, you know. So yeah, I I thought that was pretty good. I was able to eagle on the first hole. Can Is I it, give my friendly advice? Sure. Stay away from me and George on the mini golf course. Okay. That's where we don't play. Well, maybe we should stream a, a mini golf competition between us. Bring a couple other people. Uh, one of these times I come out to Vegas. Do they have a mini golf course in Vegas? 
Mm, I would assume. Not really. I don't think I've heard oh, one. Yeah, they have a really good one. It's called the Rio Kiss Mini Golf inside the Rio, but the Rio's closed. But I guess when it opens, I think they have one. Yeah, I just have to wear a disguise because yeah. I don't. I don't know if it would be unfair. You know, if they knew it was really me there. So if I can pretend like I'm someone else, then maybe they'll let us do it. He's are, right. Are you from there? I, I wouldn't be surprised if some players were <laughs> there. We can't play golf for shit, but. I know I'm one hell of a putter for sure, but but yeah, we cannot play golf for shit. But that's one thing I'm not scared of is the green for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm I'm hit or miss on the green. I'm I'm really good at my short game though. Um, anything from a pitching wedge down, I'm I'm I, I do pretty well. Um, but I, my what's always troubled me is like my my five and six iron for whatever reason. I seem to to send those left and right. Um, I'll usually pull up a hybrid and, and just hit a soft shot, and people are like, "What? What? Why are you using that?" They get so pissed. I'll hit. It'll be like a hundred, hundred and thirty yards, and and I'll just I'll just give it a little, nice little ding, and it'll go on the green, and they get super pissed. Like, you're not supposed to use that club. I'm like, oh, it worked. It works. Yeah. Hey, this is the last one I was gonna ask because golf became uh, like a five part question. Sorry about that. What I was going to ask you was, um, what is the, like in baseball, if you hit a home run off me and you stare and look at it and, you know, um, basically flip your bat, there's a good chance the next guy that comes up, I'm going to hit him. There's these unwritten rules in baseball. How is it in MMA that, you know, you've been around for 17 years. Do people in the gyms talk about, hey, someone's coming off a serious knee injury. Let's test them there. Um, you know, as far as like Pineda and your knee, um, what, you know, what's, what's like the talk about in MMA circles about that and not necessarily like to re-injure it. I'm talking about just that it might be on your mind. So he might just want to tap it like Ortega did. Well, I'm sure we, we fully expect that he will, you know? So that means I think the underwritten rule would be if anyone thinks that you have any kind of weakness, they're going to go for it. So, I mean, I would say that would be the unwritten rule. So, yeah, we're fully prepared. I've, I've been kicked in it plenty of times this camp. Uh, it, it, you know, I, it's, it's just fine. So, um, if, if he does that, I'll, I'll be looking to, you know, punch him right in the face at the same time so we can, we can both take some pain. All right. So, you can, so uh, you know, Maybe I watched too much Karate Kid, but remember Bobby Brown in the semifinals when he ran up to to Daniel Larusso and just did that karate kick right at the knee, uh -huh. and everybody was booing. But yeah, you're right. This is as real as it gets, man. Anything goes. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a dangerous game. If you if you feel like you have any edge on your opponent, you're you're gonna go for that. So I mean, uh, I don't I don't feel like anybody wouldn't do that. So yeah, I I remember one time. Going back to King of the Cage, um, the I don't know if you remember. There was a guy that in King of the Cage that looked like the logo. He was like this huge, you know, buff yeah. like guy with the mm -hmm. with the bald head. And they had gotten me a last minute replacement, and um, the guy didn't look like he was that tough. <laughs> and when I went in there, the guy the guy like checked me and made sure I you know like the referees do, um, make sure you don't have anything under you or you don't have any grease on you, you check your cup. And he said, hey, take it easy on this guy. And I looked at him, like I was in the zone, you know, and I looked at him and I was thinking in my head like, fuck no, you know? Like, I don't know if this dude's just gonna swing a wild punch and knock me out and then I lost to this dude, you know? Yeah. So I just remember thinking like, no, like this dude's gonna get my full wrath and he can give up whenever he wants. I, I I can't risk taking it easy on somebody because I underest you know like you underestimate somebody like that you that's how you get a loss so I, I don't think there's anyone in this game that that tries to take it easy. Yeah, looking back, it probably was a silly question. I know that mid fight you hear the coaches saying, "Hey, look, his eye swelling up. Hit hit that eye," or, or you know, you, you guys are are doing that. I just wasn't sure if somebody sits down and carves a game plan revolving around, "Hey, let's test them 
where we think he might have some sort of a weakness. But like in the end, you're right. Probably a dumb question. Sorry about that. No, no, it's all good. I'm sure people want to know. But yeah, I mean, I mean, three thousand one hundred prepared. I was bound to finally ask my first dumb one. You know, so it it, it just so happened that it, it happened today. All right. <laughs> Cub, thanks so much, man. Our chats are always a blessing, honestly. Seeing you from, the, you know, the early days in WEC and now still riding with you in the UFC, we really enjoy it. Thanks for being well, gracious I, with your time, as always. I can say the same about you guys. From from doing your show in your living room to, you know, you guys doing the show in Vegas uh, for so many years, it's it's been a, awesome to watch you guys as well. So, uh I appreciate you guys, and I always appreciate you guys having me on. Thank, Thank you, brother. All right. Enjoy your day, and good luck with the rest of the camp, and we'll see you in Vegas in a few weeks. All right. Appreciate it, guys. Take care. There you have it.